Hi, this is Pam, and I am uh, thrilled to be here with you today. Um, and uh, I'm going to jump right in and answer some questions. Um, so I'm here to talk about my latest book. It is called The Ambassador's Daughter. Uh, it is, some of you may know, the prequel to The Commandant's Girl, uh, which was set during World War II. And The Ambassador's Daughter takes place 20 years later, um, 20 years earlier, excuse me, um, 1919 Paris. And it is about a young, uh, it's a story of Margot. She's a young German Jewish woman, and she's at the Paris Peace Conference with her father. And um, she is... Um, she's not happy to be there. She had come from London, um, and she's been dragged to the Paris Peace Conference, and there she found, finds herself swept up in intrigue with artists in Montparnasse and, um, and unwittingly drawn into some espionage. And she also meets a young German naval officer um, na named Georg. And those of you who um, have read Commandant's Girl will know that he later becomes a high-ranking Nazi official, uh, the Commandant. So I am happy to talk about um, the book or anything else that is of interest. Um, there is a question here um, that says, what were the challenges of writing a novel that takes place in a historical setting and making it feel present day? Um, and, making it feel, and this is a really good question. Um, I don't think it's so much a question of making a, a historical novel feel like the present day, but how do you write a historical novel that feels real to the um that feels real to the reader so um it's a question of research and i think really getting historical accuracy it's not about being an encyclopedia it's about balancing the um you the, the specific historic details and just a few details that we choose with broader feeling and theme to get the right balance and make it feel real. And also what I love is not so much the differences of a historical period. What I love are the similarities. I love the timeless themes and the questions and the relationships and the issues that people and particularly women face regardless of whether it's now or nearly a century ago. Okay. Um, so I have a question here that says, um, what do I think about my book being compared to Downton Abbey? Um, and I, I'm, I'm thrilled, obviously. I'm a huge Downton Abbey fan, um, and I've written about what I think are some of the similarities. But what's exciting to me is that we've all started to latch on to this time period. You know, for so long, we've all just been talking about the Second World War, and I'm very excited about the Second World War, where so many of my books have been set. But so when I went back to start writing about 1919, I had some real angst as to whether readers would actually um, follow me back in time. And, um, and I'm excited that people have latched onto this time period with Downton Abbey and the Paris Wife and so many things because, you know, it's just a great time period. It really is, um, the world was being reborn, new countries, new roles for women, and everyone was sort of trying to find his or her place. It's really very exciting. Um, so I'm, I'm looking through the questions here. Um, I've been asked that whether there was an author or book that inspired me to write, and I'm not sure if that refers to writing um, The Ambassador's Daughter or writing in general, but I'd like to share just a little bit of background. I was one of those kids who always wanted to be a novelist. Um, and for many years, I never quite got started. And the turn point for me was actually the events, the tragic events of 9-11 when I realized that um, I didn't have forever to realize my dreaming of becoming a novelist. And if I wanted to really do this in my life, I had to get started right then. So I took a course and it was called Write Your Novel This Year and I started to write. Um, in terms of books that really inspire me, um, the, the book that really got me started is a book called by Natalie Goldberg. It's called Writing Down the Bones and it's a book that takes a Zen Buddhist approach to writing and it just really broke me open creatively, I would say. Okay. Um, and there's a question here, what was my favorite time period about which I've written? Um, that's a really tough question. You know, I've done a lot of World War II. This book is World War I. I had an earlier novel called The Things We Cherish that jumped all around the 20th century. And so I don't know that I have a favorite. Um, I, I enjoy this time period for World War One for all the reasons I've said that it's really about the world being reborn. 
I enjoy World War II um, because it was such a stark period and it really forced dire choices. But I think the, se the secret for me, regardless of which time period we're talking about, is if I can put the reader in the shoes of the protagonist and force the reader to ask him or herself, what would I have done in those circumstances? Then I think it will make for good reading regardless of the time period. Um, there's a question here. How long did it take me to write this novel? You know, it's a funny thing. Um, novels always take me about a year, a little more or a little less. I don't know why, but no matter when I think I'm going to finish, it's the oddest thing. I always wind up finishing a novel right around Memorial Day. Um, and the same will be the case this year. I'm working on a novel set during the Second World War, and it's about two sisters in in rural Poland who find an American paratrooper. One of them finds an American paratrooper wounded in the woods and um, the length she'll go to to help this paratrooper. And again, I'll finish the book probably at the end of May and it'll come out next year. Okay. Um, and so there's a question here about research. How much research do I do to write a novel? It really varies. Um, I, by way of background, lived in Europe for a number of years. I lived in England when I went to graduate school at Cambridge, where I actually wrote about the World War I time period. And I, um, I lived in Poland for two and a half years when I was working for the State Department. So to some extent, some of my research is actually um, based on experience, the streets I've walked and the places I lived. And I have to double check, of course, but some of it is very intuitive to me. Um, other things are harder, you know. Um, I don't get to travel the way I used to. I have three preschoolers, two of whom are downstairs sick at the moment, um, and my wings are sort of clipped. So if you get to certain settings, maybe I can't go right now, or maybe I haven't been recently, and that's when the research really comes into play. It can be online research, you use maps, you use old diaries, periodicals are fabulous, sort of whatever you need to get the whole picture of the era. Okay. Um, so there is a question here about my covers of my books and loving the covers. Someone says, I love the covers. Uh, did I have any input? And so um, I love the cover too on this one. Thank you so much. Um, covers are always a really tricky thing. Um, typically, I get to give some input at an early stage where I describe the key themes of the book, the key settings of the book, and what I feel the image will, you know, what sort of images would work. And then, the, then they just go with it. And I really don't see it again or have any involvement until I get a nearly finished cover. Um, and I'm asked for input, but at that point it's already gone. And I will tell you, I love my covers. It is so much fun to have some of the earliest readers of a manuscript step inside your head and create um, this beautiful, rich artwork that, you know, really captures the feel of the book. So I quite enjoy seeing my covers. It's always a thrill. Um, I see a question here um, that says, um, what advice would I give aspiring writers? And I love this question. Um, it's from a reader who happens to also already be a Facebook friend of mine. And I urge you all to find me on Facebook or Twitter. I'm, I'm very easily accessible there. Um, but what advice would I give to aspiring writers? And so I always give three pieces of advice. Um, the first is that you have to be disciplined um, to become a writer. When I decided to become a writer in earnest, I was a new attorney at a big law firm with a thousand dollars a month in student loan debt. So I couldn't go sit in a castle and write. Um, I used to write from five to seven in the morning before I went to my day job. And that routine persisted for many years. And I think if you want to be a writer, you have to be disciplined and carve out that space for yourself and say no to things that are going to get in the way of your writing. Second, I think you have to be really tenacious and really determined as a writer. Um, my first book did not sell for a really long time, and you sort of have to take a mindset, if this one doesn't sell, I'm going to write another one. Um, because I will tell you, I've met um, many writers who I think are more talented along the way in writer's workshop who may not be published, and what separates me from them is that I kept trying um, and kept going until the door opened. And the last thing I want to tell you is that as, as a writer, I think it's very important to be able to have the ability to revise, to take feedback from agents and editors and incorporate it into your own work. Okay. Um, there's a great question here. Which is it harder to create, good guys or bad guys? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, 
you know, I certainly think that the, um, the I certainly think that the the bad guys are more interesting, right? If you do it right, but I don't always enjoy spending time with them. And the good guys are fun, but you have to give them something, some flaw, some you know dark past in order to uh, to keep keep them interesting. So it's definitely I like both. I would say. Okay. Um, for you, do the characters tell you the story as you write, or do you outline the whole story and stick to the plot you wrote? Um, I was asked this question recently. Someone said, are you a plotter or a pantser? And I said, what? Another writer said, are you a plotter or a pantser? And I'd never heard of this, but apparently, I'm sure you all know this, that writers who are plotters are the ones who outline. And ones who are pantsers, or the seat of your pants, those are the writers that just kind of go as they go along. So here's my process. I usually start with an image or an idea or a scene in my mind, and I don't really know what that scene is. And I write, and I throw down, I let myself throw in the computer, throw down on a, on a, in a document, whatever comes out, scenes, dialogue, you know, in, interior monologue, whatever comes out for about 150 pages. And then at 150 pages, when that document starts getting unwieldy, um, then I go back and I give it structure. I start giving charts and outlines and chapters. Um, but typically I'll throw down a lot of stuff before I get to any sort of structure. Um, there's a great question here. How long did it take you to find a literary agent? Um, you know, I was originally with one agency and I switched over, so it's sort of a hard question. Um, but when I did the process, it was back in sort of pre-internet, you know, pre-email days where you were still sending snail mail to get an agent. So I remember sending out 100 queries and of the 100 agents, maybe 30 wanted to see partials and 15 wanted to see fulls. And um, the agent I wound up with, who is amazing, um, Scott Hoffman at Folio Literary is my agent. He's I've been with him for about 10 years now. And he um, he wanted a lot of work to that first book before I, he would take it on. So I really had to do the work. But um, when you find a great relationship with an agent, it is just gold. Um, there's a question here. Do I have a favorite romantic novel or movie? Hmm, I don't know. My movie tastes really span from Casablanca to Love Actually, um, you know, Crazy Stupid Love. I, I like a really wide variety of stuff. Um, and novels, I don't know that I'd say that there's one romantic one more so or less, but two novels I've been talking about a lot lately when people ask me fall in the historical realm and they're not romantic per se if you want to label but um, I really love The Postmistress by Sarah Blake I thought that was an amazing novel and um, there's a more recent one called All That I Am by Anna Funder and I talk up her book all the time because I thought it was very very good um, what's my favorite character that I've written so far and do I find that certain characters stay with me after I finish the book Ooh, choosing between characters as your favorite um, is really, really hard. It's like choosing between your kids, which of course I would never do. Um, so Emma was the protagonist in Commandant's Girl. I liked her a lot. But then when I got to Diplomat's Wife, Marta was a lot like me. She was kind of messy and her hair was disheveled and just, you know, a lot less polished than Emma. So I liked her for that reason. Um, I've written a couple modern books. Jordan in Almost Home is an awful lot like me. She's the protagonist in Almost Home in A Hidden Affair. Uh, Charlotte in The Things We Cherish was a Philadelphia lawyer, so there's a little bit of me in her. Um, I like Margot a lot, um, and she becomes friends with Krisha, who's the older woman, the aunt from The Commandant's Girl, and I'm pretty fond of her, so I can't pick. I can't do it. I can't do it. Hmm, let's see. Um... Questions are coming fast and furious here. How did the events in this book foreshadow the horrors to come in the next World War? World War I is such an interesting time period because, you know, you have the world being reborn. So you get to the Paris Peace Conference when everybody's got an agenda for the new world order. And the really interesting thing about that is that, um, you know, uh, people come to the conference with such different expectations. So, for example, Georg is a naval officer from Germany who hopes that despite defeat, Germany may actually get to play some role, the German military, in what is to come in the world. 
Um, and of course, he finds that's not to be. The Germans are demilitarized and there's heavy reparations. And so there's a lot of disillusionment coming out of the Paris Peace Conference that I really think sets the stage for what's to come in the next two decades. Okay. Um, so here, it's, there's a question, which of my books would I want turned into a feature film and why? Um, I'd like all of them to be films and none of them are yet. So I always say from your mouth to God's ears, someone will option the film, but um, none of them are yet. But um, I do think they'd work. Uh, the Commandant's Girl trilogy, which in now includes The Ambassador's Daughter, I think would work really well as film or miniseries would be really, really good. Um, and then there's a question here that says, do you have a favorite of your books? Now nah, it's kind of like the characters. I can't choose between them. Um, I think Commandant's Girl's been the most successful. Almost Home is a sentimental favorite. Um, you know, I'm pretty proud of the where the things we cherished was written, but of course the ambassador's daughter is now my baby, so um, I want to see my baby thrive. Um, there's a question here. After I found my agent, how long before I connected with my publisher? Um, this is a great story, and I hope you'll indulge me telling it. Um, after I got my agent, my first book, The Commandant's Girl, was turned down by every publisher in the world. And my agent thought, said, well, go write another book, which is no small thing, and we'll sell that one first. So I was toiling away on another book um, for about 11 months. And one day at the firm on Friday, my phone rings, and it's my agent who never calls. And um, I said, are you firing me, you know, because I haven't sold any books? And he said, no, I'm calling to tell you that I sold Commandant's Girl. And it turned out that there was one publisher that was still holding on to it, and, uh, and we sold the book. And uh, now that things have gone well, other publishers like to act like they knew it all along, but I have rejection letters from all of them. Um, so that is my story. It was about 11 months. But from the time I started writing my first book until the time I could walk into Barnes & Noble and see it was about five years. Um, and I think that's not terribly long by most standards. Let's see. Um, so what advice do I have for about dealing with accents and colloquialisms and language patterns of the past when dealing with dialogue? Um, this is such a hard question um, because bear in mind you're not just dealing with um, the ways of speaking in English, but when I'm writing a book, those people would really be speaking in French or German or Polish, so you're constantly thinking about um, which language are they using here, right? And then you're thinking about how to drop in a hint of foreign words, um, you know, but not just to give it a flavor, but not too much. And then no matter how many times I do it and how many people I have proofread it, you know, there's always something I just get wrong, some expression that should not have been used. But um, I guess that's part of the process. Next question is, do you have plans to write a book about any other specific period of history? So my next book, as I mentioned, will go back to the Second World War, and I'm really excited about that. I still think there's a ton to be said about, you know, what went on during World War II, and I'll be writing that, although it will be very different. It'll be set in Poland, but um, it, it will be a very different perspective from what I've done before. And then after that, I think I want to stay in the World War II time frame, but I think I want to come back to the home front. So um, my books have been, uh, you know, all set in Europe, almost predominantly, almost exclusively, I should say, set in Europe. And I'd like to do something set on the home front during World War II. Okay. Um, there's a question here that says, when you initially wrote The Ambassador's Daughter, did you have plans for it to become a trilogy? So I never had any plans for continuing any sorts of series. I wrote The Commandant's Girl and my character was supposed to walk off into the sunset. I wrote The Commandant's Girl first, which was the, the middle book of the series, if you will. And what happened was one morning as I'm brushing my teeth, um, I, I, another character from Commandant's Girl raises her hand and she says, it's my turn. And I thought, I thought you were dead. Um, but she was um, this other woman, and her story became the sequel to Commandant's Girl, and it was called The Diplomat's Wife. It's set in 1946 uh, London, predominantly. And it was very challenging writing a sequel. I have a love-hate relationship with sequels, um, but that's another story. But then um, people were always asking for another book in the series, and I thought, hmm, if I keep going forward in time, we're going to be in the 1960s, and it doesn't feel like historical. So what about a prequel? And a prequel is, of course, challenging because you're writing the story of people 
and everyone knows what happens to them 20 years later. So how do you keep it interesting? But it actually turned out to be really, really fun with a lot of uh, twists and turns that surprised even me. Um, let's see. There's a question here that says, when did you realize you wanted to write novels? Well, I've always wanted to be a novelist. Even as a child, I was um, scribbling down stories and showing them to people. And that was just, um, that was just my thing. So it is a huge thrill. It is actually my rock star dream to become a novelist. And it's so, so, so much fun. What are your early thoughts after you release a book? Um, it's sheer terror. Uh, I think I wrote a blog some once called fear and loathing the five scariest moments in a writer's life but clearly one of them is either right before you have a book come out or right after because all you do the whole time is you check your Amazon rankings all the time and then lately you check your Goodreads reviews and there's nothing worse than like the first three reviewers skewer you and there's no good reviews yet and you're sure everyone's gonna hate the book of course that challenge changes and lots of gracious people like the books but um in the beginning all you do is you, uh, you know, you, you obsessively Google search yourself every 10 minutes to see if anything's popped up about the book. So that's how, that's pretty much what it's like. I'm miserable to around people in those few days when a book comes out. Um, let's see. So there's a question here that says, who would I cast as Margot and Georg in a movie? So I haven't actually thought about this question. I'm embarrassed to say. Um, but if anyone wants to pop up on the dialogue screen and give me some suggestions, I'd love to hear them. Uh, Georg actually appears later in the uh, in the Commandant's Girl, and I've always seen him as sort of maybe a, a Liam Neeson type at that later stage in his life, um, when he's, you know, in his 50s or 40s. Um, but earlier, I don't know. Um, I, you know, there, there's lots of actors that I love that I would just want to find a way to put in my book, you know. Um, I, you know, I love, I love uh, Bradley Cooper, but he's not terribly European, so I'm not quite sure how I'd work him in. Um, i trying to think of who my other sort of crush actors are. But let me know who you think should be and email me, Facebook me. Let me know who should be my characters when the fabulous movie rights get optioned. If I couldn't write anymore, what other profession would I be drawn to? That's a great question. So by way of confession, I have another profession that rhymes. Um, I, um, in my day job, and I spend about equal time between the two, I am actually a law school professor. Um, I teach at Rutgers, and I teach everything from legal writing to evidence. And I have to say, I also adore being a professor. So um, I'm pretty caught between the two. Um, you know, and of course, my very favorite job is being mom to three preschoolers, even uh, when they're sick. Um, so that's great. So I really haven't thought about it. I think I have enough jobs for right now. Let's see. My books have been described as romantic suspense. What do I think about that? Um, so um, I, I struggle with labels because when I wrote my first novel, um, you know, I, I never thought about it as romance versus not romance. I wrote Commandant's Girl and then publisher, Publishers Weekly uh, called it historic romance at its finest, um, which was very nice of them. Um, and it was nominated for a Quill Award in the romance category. We lost to Nora Roberts, but it was fun to be nominated. And so from there on out, I've always been called um, romance, sometimes romantic suspense. But the books weave so many different things and there's the historical, the romance, the suspense, there's, you know, the personal development so I don't really, um, I don't mind whatever you want to call my books as long as you enjoy them, I would say. Oh, I'm getting over the line here some great suggestions for who should play Margot and Georg. So someone said Georg should be Aiden Quinn. Um, and I can't remember, is he, he might, I'm not sure if he's older, or if, but he might work just fine. Um, and I see Rachel McAdams as Margot. That sounds lovely to me. Um, and um, let's see. Um, there's a question here, do I miss being a foreign service officer? So by way of background, when I was in Poland, I was a diplomat for the State Department. Um, and I was in Krakow, Poland for two and a half years uh, doing all sorts of work. Everything from stamping visas and passports to helping American citizens to working on issues related to the Holocaust and Jewish issues in Poland. And I will tell you that um, I think being a diplomat is the finest work with the finest group of people you can possibly imagine. All of my friends I started with are still in the Foreign Service and they do remarkable work for our country all around the globe and I'm so 
am just in awe of what they do and the way they put their lives out there every single day. Um, you know, I think of them every day. For me, it was just a lifestyle choice that I wanted to come home and be closer to my family. But certainly there's a part of me that could be out there, you know, hopping on that plane at just about any minute. So, um, any other questions? Um, I'm trying, still looking for more suggestions of, for casting. What do I do for fun when I'm not writing? This is a great question. I think the question should be, what did I used to do with fun when I, for fun when I wasn't writing? Because I have three kids under the age of four. So I don't, um, really think, I mean, my fun is their fun. You know, I'm a get up and go mom and I like being outdoors with them. I'm desperate for spring right now. Um, but my things that I enjoy doing other than spending time with my kids and, and my husband, um, I love to go outlet shopping with my mom. Um, I love to scream my head off at a Philadelphia Eagles game with my brother. Um, I would love a good nap. Um, you know, if I had a day to myself, the big four would be writing, napping, shopping, and I'm forgetting what, and exercising, you know, I love to run or, you know, go to the gym, something simple like that would be very, very nice. But, um, I like some sleep, I think. Let's see. Um, so let's see. Um, how much time do I dedicate to working on books and balancing that with being a professor and a mother? Um, my mantra is I do too many things and none of them well, but I'm just joking, hopefully. Um, uh, my favorite, I think it's just a question of discipline. Um, my very favorite quote, it was from Anne Lamott, and she said, before children, I couldn't write if there were dirty dishes in the sink. And after children, I could write if there was a corpse in the sink. And that's so true. I think the writing doesn't care if you are, you know, tired or busy or someone is using your office as a guest room, the writing just cares if it gets done. Um, so it's not pretty. Um, I don't think I wrote today because I taught and then came home to sick children, but I will have my tush in the chair at eight o'clock tomorrow morning to get my time in. You know, it's just, it, it's just a certain um, discipline. I can write anywhere. I could write in my car. I could write in the doctor's waiting room. It just, you know, deadlines keep me going these days. So it, somehow it gets done. I'm not sure it's not pretty. It's not pretty, but it gets done. Um, let's see. Um, with all that I do, do I ever have time to read for fun? What types of books and authors do I love? Um, well, I already mentioned The Postmistress and All That I Am, which were a couple of recent favorites, but I like a really wide range. Um, I don't read anything terribly heavy. I read for pleasure when I'm when I have the time. Um, I like Kate Atkinson, her mysteries in Britain. I like Laura Lipman, her mysteries in Baltimore. Um, I love Anita Shreve. I love Tracy Chevalier, who wrote Girl with a Pearl Earring, is a big favorite of mine. Barbara Kingsolver. Um, you know, I just, a, a kind of a wide range of, of authors, just sort of whatever captures me. I, like you, I'm always excited um, when an author I love comes out with a new book. It's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And there's some, I think, this spring coming, so I need to uh, get my res you know pre-orders in. Okay. Did another World War One novel inspire me? I did actually read a lot of World War One, um, mostly nonfiction and research this time. But I will tell you um, that years ago, I read A Soldier of the Great War um, uh, by Mark Halperin. And uh, I read it when I was, I was Euro railing. I lived, at, I was at Cambridge at the time, and I got stuck in a train strike in little France. And, uh, got, and I was reading as I waited for a train back to England and re really vividly remember that book from a World War One perspective. Um, how do I get my book news? New York Times reviews, Amazon. Um, you know, I read a wide range. I, I don't read that much, but you know, I read um, Publishers Weekly. Over in the UK, there's the Bookseller, um, Publishers Marketplace. I read uh, publication, you know, Shelf Awareness, um, Library Journal, Booklist. I'm, I'm on all the all the lists. You know, I, I get all the emails. Um, of course, I look at Amazon. I, you know, I think the great mystery for writers today is in this um, in this ebook era. How are people picking their novels? And I'm just, I, you know, how are pick people picking what they read? And I just don't, uh, I mean, I think People Magazine does fabulous book reviews, um, you know, so I, but I just, uh, I'm not sure how people are picking what they read these days. It's a good question. Let's see. Um, there's a quote here, there's a question here that says, that I hear you like Downton Abbey. Who's your favorite character 
and why hmm i just watched last night i just caught up on my downton last night um and um who's my favorite character on downton i like Ma uh matthew crawley's mother um she's kind of she always has something zingy and non-conventional to say so she's pretty fun um I, but i like it's an ensemble cast i mean you have to you know what they do so well is is just the the uh, again, i've written about this but they have so many different things going on at once Okay. Hmm. What are my vices? That's a great question. Many. Um, no, I don't really have too many. Um, so I guess my vices, well, I'm going to, I guess the easy ones to pick are food. I'm definitely more of an eater than a drinker. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a big chocolate person and a big caffeine. Caffeine is a huge vice. Um, the guy at the local Starbucks said I drink so much coffee, so much caffeine, it scares him. Um, but, and part of that comes from when I was pregnant with my twins, I couldn't have any caffeine, no chocolate, no coffee for many, many, many months. And so I've sort of backlash to that. So um, the caffeine, chocolate kind of thing, big vices for me. Um... Are my students aware that I write or do I keep the live separate? So I actually write under my own name. Um, you know, I never even changed my name uh, when I got married. So this has my, been my name my whole life. I write under my name. So it's no secret at school that I'm at the university where I teach law school that I'm a novelist. Um, but I don't make a big deal about it. You know, I view it as separate. So um, I might, I do talk to my students about fiction writing to the extent that it helps their legal writing. And sometimes when they're nervous about showing me their work, I encourage them, go on Amazon and see all the cruddy things people say about me. Because being a writer means putting yourself out there. And I sort of do that to gain their trust. Um, but I certainly don't push my novels at school. Uh, you know, it's just a separate world. Let's see. Do I have any quirky things I do when I'm writing? I think, you know, I do have my rituals. Um, well, I lo one thing that's not so quirky but just helps a lot is I take notes at night which give me prompts to write from in the morning. I'll read something and I'll take notes and ideas for writing so that if in the morning I'm tired or blocked, I can just go. I don't have to say, hmm, what am I going to write? I sort of have some prompts. So that's very helpful. The other big thing I do is that um, I, when I'm about to finish a book and I've got a, a printed out manuscript, I go away for a weekend and I go away um, to I go away to the beach to this tiny little motel, nothing fancy, and I just me in the book for a weekend and I just sort of beat the manuscript into submission. So I really look forward to that. It's usually in May I go away and take care of that. Would I be interested in writing a book? with another author, do I think it would be hard to mesh different writing styles? I'm not a co-writer. I just um, co-wrote an article for school. And it was very, very hard for me to co-write. But I will tell you, and this is, I'm not even sure I'm supposed to be talking about this yet. There is, I've been asked to participate in an anthology of women's historical fiction writers. And I'm not sure I can really say who yet because it's not all firmed up. But I think it'll be very exciting when it's announced. And so that won't be co-writing, but I will have a short story um, that will be one of 10 or so. And I think that's gonna be a really exciting venture that doesn't actually involve co-writing. Let's see. Um, do I have a preference for video chat interviews, phone interviews, or in-person interviews for publicity? Um, so let me say, this is one of my first, maybe my first video chat. So I like it a lot. Um, so this could be a preference. Um, and of course, in-person is really nice, but it's not always possible. Phone interviews are great. Um, I'm discovering that Skype and phone are wonderful because, let me just say, um, any book club that features any of my books, I'm always happy to phone in or Skype. And I just really love developing long-term relationships with my readers um, by Facebook, by Twitter, by, you know, Skype, whatever it is, um, I like to keep that connection going. Let's see. Um, there's a question here. Do I write one book at a time or am I writing one, editing one, and plotting a third? I write one book at a time um, in that I really do go start to finish over the course of a year to finish a book. But usually when you're 
getting to the end of one book and you know you're or maybe you're in the dark middle place you start thinking about the next book and you get excited excited sometimes more excited about the one you're going to write than the one you're desperately trying to finish so I might allow myself to put some notes in a document about the next book but really um, I have to keep my head in the one book because the, the timelines the deadlines are really tight in writing let's see what is my writing atmosphere like? Do I listen to music, need silence, snacks? This is a great question. I've actually been doing my, some work with my students on knowing yourself as a writer and how to optimize the circumstances that you're going to write in for best effect. So what would my perfect writing world be? My perfect writing world would be starting at six in the morning, going through to 10 or 11, um, total silence, maybe in my office, a ton of coffee. Um, I like hard candy, like mints for drafting, all of these sorts of things. Um, however, I also think that knowing your perfect writing time is really good because you can optimize that. So I can save the mornings for my writing, um, but you also have to be able to push the boundaries of yourself as a writer. So I say, okay, maybe I can only write in the morning, um, but I can do my plotting or my outlining in the afternoon afternoon or evening, right? I have to push the boundaries. Or recently, I was even able to write, you know, in the afternoon, and that was just very empowering to me. So I'm a big advocate of know what works for you as a writer, but don't make it self-limiting. Let's see. Hmm. If I could live in a book, which book would I choose? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. I'd love to hear some suggestions from people. Of my books, I don't know if I want to live in any of my books because they're pretty, you know, there's people go through some pretty tough things. But, um, but I, you know, I'd love to hear if there's a book you think you'd like to live in. I'm not really sure myself. Um, there's a great question here. Do I do any traveling to research my books? I used to. Um, you know, I used to, if I had a scene set in London, I would walk you know, on walk Hammersmith by Hammersmith Bridge, or I'd walk up Fleet Street to see exactly where it breaks so you can see St. Paul's. Um, I don't get to travel right now because of my three preschoolers, um, so I have to get a little more creative in how I research these things, but I really, really, really would like to, so if you can, travel for me and let me know about it. Um, am I planning a sequel to The Ambassador's Daughter? This is a really fun question. I would say the sequel has actually already been written because Commandant's Girl comes 20 years after The Ambassador's Daughter. It features many of the same people. And if you read The Commandant's Girl, you will know exactly what happens to the people in The Ambassador's Daughter. So I sort of think the sequel has been written. Um, and not that I, you couldn't do something with the interim 20 years, you know, but um, I think it's been written. And I am working on another Second World War to you know, Second World Second World War book. Sorry, I'm a little sleep deprived. Second World War book, but it's 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 not necessarily the same character, same feel as Commandant's Girl, but different story. Let's see. Do I have favorite children's authors whose books you read to your children? Yes, my children are really small. So typically when someone asks what I'm reading, I say it's probably something that rhymes. It's something as, as elementary as, um, is your mama a llama? I mean, that's sort of the level I'm at reading with my children. But it's funny as a writer, what you start reading into children's books. So um, I'm reading, you know, if I'm reading Thomas the Tank Engine, I say, oh, Thomas does, you know, bridging conflict really well. I like how they put those plots together and I start trying to see all sorts of other things in it. But I'm very excited about my children just starting to read. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, and of course, it's always fun to sh go in the bookstore and show my uh, son pictures. I have a conflict when I go in the bookstore. I love to walk into Barnes & Noble, say, can I autograph your stock? Oh, yes, that's my book. But usually my children are tearing apart their store. So instead of identifying myself, I sort of creep out mortified. Let's see. Has Facebook, Twitter helped you to connect with your fans on a deeper level? Absolutely. Um, I So I have, this is my confession. I'm a longtime Facebook user. I just became a Twitter convert, and I'm completely addicted to Twitter. And now I feel like I'm cheating on my Facebook friends. But let's say we can have both, um, which I think is possible. They give me the ability to have a long-term relationship with readers. So um, I have people that I've talked to for years, and I keep connected with, and I, you know, and I really I have people right in you know right in my personal account so it's not like I segregate it in any way shape or form um, and you know so I feel like I know many of these people even better than I do I think it's one of the great things is the the, the direct and 
two-way relationship that we're able to have as a result of these these different programs. Um, there's a question here. What is it about the first half of the 20th century um, which draws me to write about it? Um, it's not so much that I've ever thought about, okay, I'm going to write about the first half of the 20th century. Um, when I first wrote Commandant's Girl, it was really about um, my years in Poland and my experiences working on Holocaust issues that made me want to write this novel that reflected those experiences. And I started to just dig in and I found World War II is just such a fertile ground um, for, you know, comp for compelling fiction because the choices were so dire that people faced. Um, so that was one thing. And then when I go back to World War One. Um, as I may have said, I did my master's thesis at Cambridge on the Paris Peace Conference and the League of Nations Covenant. So it was just a, a ball to actually get to go back and, uh, and you know, explore that period on a fictional level as well. Let's see. Um, there's a comment here that says, I'd love to travel like Charlotte to The Hague and The Things We Cherish. So if you have not read The Things We Cherished, it was my immediate previous novel. Um, and it's a book that toggles between present day and um, different points in the 20th century. And it surrounds an accused Nazi collaborator. Um, and he, he, you know, the search, the search for his innocence, his guilt or innocence lies with this antique clock. So it's somewhat of a mystery. Um, and Charlotte, um, who is a, uh, a, a public defender in Philadelphia, goes back to Europe to uh, find out the truth about this man's guilt or innocence. So uh, that is an excellent comment. This says, I love historical fiction and this sounds really good. What authors do you think do a great job with fact checking and weaving those facts into a believable story with made up characters? Um, facts in history are such a hard question for me. I saw recently a really well known author of historical fiction who said, um, this person said that no matter how hard you try, there is always some reader waiting to tell you you have the wrong beret on your character on the beaches of Dunkirk. And that's so true because I guarantee you I can be writing something in England and I can have 12 English proofreaders and 12 English copy editors and someone will find the mistake. There's there, there's always going to be something. So I try not to... Uh, be too hard on my colleagues with respect to historical accuracy. I think we're all trying really, really hard to get it right. Um, and as I said earlier, I think it's just about using the right amount of facts um, to give it an authentic feel when you're exploring some really timeless themes in fiction. What are, I see something here that says, what are some of my guilty pleasure TV shows? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, obviously Downton Abbey is a big one. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a popcorn junkie. I have a hot air popper prominently placed in my kitchen. And, you know, um, the, my family knows when they hear the hot air popper going, one of my shows is on that night. Um, so Downton Abbey, um, The Office, perhaps not this season, but The Office in general, Grey's Anatomy. Um, I love all the HBO and Showtime type of series. Oh, Homeland, 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 um, because I am um, a lifelong Mandy Patankin fanatic. And you take Mandy Patankin and you take Damian Lewis from Band of Brothers, which is also amazing, and you put them in the same place. And of course, Claire Danes and Homeland would probably be my guiltiest pleasure at the moment. Yes. Do I speak French and do I use a lot of it in the book? Um, I do not speak French. Um, I speak Polish. Uh, what, not very well, but I speak Polish. But um, And I had a little German. Um, but the French, I had to rely on the kindness of friends and editors. So hopefully I haven't botched it too badly. How do I find time to write with three small children at home? This is a great question. Um, I have the most hands-on husband in the world, um, which enables me to go on book tour and do whatever I have to do and, and you know, miss people but not worry that anyone's, in, you know, not doing well. And I have a mom who lives a mile down the road um, who has been here 24-7 this week while my kids are sick. And I would like to buy the domain name GodBlessLocalGrandparents.com because without her, um, I would not be making it. Um, yeah, it's just that that is how I get it done. So... Um, so let's see, um, oh, let's see. Um, hey, this question is um, from a reader asking if I'll be the, be traveling to New York for any signings or discussions. So upcoming appearances. My next appearance, I'm not going to be in New York, but I will be in Hartford, Connecticut later this month. Um, 
and I will be in West Palm Beach next month and then a bunch of things in the Philadelphia area and there's always new things being added to the schedule so if you want to know when I'll be coming to your area please just um, email me um, you know off my website or Facebook and I'll let you know let's see when my kids are old enough to read my books would I like them to hmm um, you know I think yes um, first of all it's funny um, one of the characters in one of my books is a Charlotte and I have a Charlotte that was pure coincidence um, but um, would I like them to read my books yes my I think my sex scenes are pretty mild um, I, I write what I would describe as fade to black sex you know it's when you're a kid and you're watching the love boat and they turn the lights out I used to think they just turned the lights out um, that they were going to sleep or leaving um, but it's what I call fade to black sex so I don't write terribly graphic scenes um, probably more for my mom than for my kids I was when I did that um, but I think it's in all seriousness my books have a um, theme of strong women um, and strong people and people making choices and taking responsibilities for their choices and the gray areas in those choices and I think those are themes that I would be proud to have my kids read about yes let's see um, when did I know I wanted to become a writer always um, always always and it was always going to be novels so this is this is a great thrill um, to uh, to be able to do this it is really just my dream of my life Okay, thoughts on Fifty Shades of Grey, love it or hate it, do I think the craze will fade? Um, so let me say, I started Fifty Shades, I didn't finish Fifty Shades, it, isn't, it wasn't my speed. Um, hats off um, to, to the writer, is, is it E.L. James, am I going to say that wrong? I don't want to say her name wrong, but she's revolutionized publishing and, you know, more power to her. I think it's just an amazing phenomenon. It wasn't really my speed. In particular, there was a quote in there um, where the purportedly American char character said something like, I'm crap at DIY, and it just sounded really British, and it kind of threw me off. Um, but again, my hat's off to her for what she's done for publishing. Let's see. Any people in my past that inspired me to become a writer? Um, I certainly know some writers, some writer friends, uh, you know, um, and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know. It was just my love of books that really drove me to become a writer. It wasn't, um, it, you know, I just knew that I knew that that was it for me. So it was. It's really, really a nice thing. And of course, there's many writers who. There's a really nice community of writers because even though, even as I said to you that. I get to connect with you um, as readers, and that's great. There's a community of writers on Facebook and Twitter, and I'll sort of say, oh, yeah, that writer, I know her. And what I mean is I've actually never met her, but we're online together, and we sort of sustain and inspire each other, um, you know, writing endorsements for books and conferences, and it's just a really nice community. Let's see. Um, is how much time is spent on marketing a new book when first published? Interviews, traveling, book signings. It really varies from book to book. Um, when my first book came out, I probably visited 50 book clubs, and that took a lot of time, 50 in person, you know. And now, um, you know, I can't get out as much, so I do more Skype and phone. Sometimes it's a lot of online. Sometimes there's some radio. Um, it's certainly, I think, pub promoting your book might be the fourth job if mom professor writer are three jobs i think that promoting the book then becomes uh, um, a fourth job for that time period but obviously it's a great great thing and it's a great thing to have publishers um who partner with you to promote your books i can't say what a huge difference that makes them publicists i mean book trib um is an amazing platform for writers and i'm so glad you're all here and um you know it's just really gratifying so i'm very very happy to put in the time let's see um what is um the last movie i saw in theaters that did i enjoy it oh this is bad um no um so let let me be let me be diplomatic um well my husband and i very very seldom get out to movies like, if you're thinking about having children public service announcement do two things right now take naps and see movies because you can go to a restaurant with a kid but you movies are really tough so um the th last thing i saw in the movies that i loved was crazy stupid love i really did enjoy that and then i went to see the new la gangster one with gosling and and the woman from crazy stupid love i think and i have to say we walked out so no i didn't enjoy that one but i liked the one before it um 
Do I ever worry about setting my books against such momentous times in history as World War I? Yes, I always worry about setting my books against momentous periods in history. So, um, I remember I was writing, uh, I was writing Commandant's Girl, and I saw Band of Brothers, which I think is the finest thing ever put on film, and um, I, they were liberating a concentration camp, and it was so moving, I thought, who am I to be writing dinner parties in Krakow while, um, you know, while the, uh, while this was going on right around on the very streets, you know, the, this, the, you know, just miles away, there's a concentration camp. And I had the sense of being overwhelmed and daunted. And I thought, well, I'm writing this because they really were going on at that time period. But there's always this sense of uh, moral obligation to get it right, to get it right for the people who lived in those times. Yeah, it's very daunting. And sometimes it can stop you. And then you think if it's going to stop me, then I'm not going to write this book. And then what would happen? So you just press on. Let's see. Um, how do I handle it when I read a less than favorable review? Oh, it crushes you every single time. It crushes you. And you think no one is going to read this book and this is going to be the worst experience. It truly crushes you, um, no doubt. Um, and you, But then you'll get an email from a reader which just totally lifts you up, you know. So, so it's a balance. I do read my reviews. I read every stinking review, all the bad ones. And I try and get some perspective. Um, my favorite bad review said she looks like she's 12 years old and she writes like it too so whenever I'm sad about bad reviews I try and remember that one so um let's see what do I what are my thoughts on ebooks um I love books I don't care how you read as long as you read um and uh and, and I'm just it's hard to know how to market ebooks here's my big complaint with ebooks I have never walked down the street or the beach or the subway platform and seen someone reading one of my books and I want to walk up to them and say do you like that book? Um, and that's never happened yet. And as long as people are reading on Kindles and I can't tell what they're reading, I'm afraid that won't happen. So uh, that's my only complaint, but I don't mind people reading on ebook format. There's a question that says, do I write with pen and paper or on a computer? Um, the actual writing on the computer, uh, you know, just typing furiously, but a lot of the outlining, problem solving, note taking I do on paper. And I will also say there's a difference that when I'm just free form writing, I can do it on a laptop pretty much anywhere. But when you get really down to editing, I need a big screen. I need to be at a desk because I want to see the layout of how everything flows together. So that's a big difference for me as well. What else can I tell you? This is very odd just staring into my computer, but I, I love answering all these questions. Um, if my books became movies, would I be the one to want to adapt them to a screenplay? No, I'm not a screenwriter. I can't write anything else, not poems, not articles. I really don't write anything else. I just write novels. So I'd like a very talented screenwriter, but I would like to uh, go to the premiere, I will say. So I think we're actually um, getting close to the end of the hour. Um, and oh, here's another question. Okay. Um, what kind of research did I do for the ambassador's daughter? Well, everything. Um, I love periodicals from the time period, you know, that, that were available at the time period. I read a ton about the artists of Montparnasse, of course, a lot about the Paris Peace Conference and what was going on there. Um, uh, you know, uh, everything, old photographs, um, picture books. And I'm really lucky. I work at a university with a great library, interlibrary system. So most times when I need an old dusty research book, I put, pop it in the computer and the book comes up and uh, and I just order it so you know it comes delivered to me to borrow so I'm very lucky to have that resource as well um, there's a question here whether Margot is reminiscent of anyone in my real life now you know some of my characters tend to look like people I know um, but I I don't think Margot, um, what happened was Margot, you know, was mentioned in the first book as the commandant's first wife, his wife, and she wasn't there, but her picture was on his desk and she was very beautiful and, and enigmatic. So I was with that, my curiosity and Margot really came from that place. Let's see. Um, there's something that says, I remember my parents and grandparents talking about the world wars. Do I have memories of relatives talking about them? Well, when I was in Poland, it wasn't my relatives per se, but I became very close to the surviving Jewish community in Krakow. And, um, and so that was, uh, you know, that I, the, the elderly people trusted me and they told me their stories from the war and that definitely weaves the fabric of what I write. 
Um, there is a question here that says, will I travel with my children when they're older? Um, yes, I will definitely travel with them. But right now, I've got three children, very small, very scattery, and we are outnumbered. It's zone defense, and we are outnumbered. So I will travel with them when they are older. And then there's a question about what did my previous careers bring to my writing? Um, well, obviously, my years in Europe uh, brought me those exp rich experiences that I write about. And being a lawyer, I think, helps a lot with the writing and, in particular, the ability to edit and revise your work. One's work, my work. Um, and, but, and, and then um, there's a question here about has my work at the State Department um, affected the ambassador's daughter and its characters? Well, yes, because I had that sort of experience and that insight into, I guess, diplomacy and negotiations and world matters. Um, so obviously I had to research the specific facts for this time period, but um, I did have that background, which was very useful. So um, at some point, I think there's some uh, giveaway um, names that I'm supposed to announce. I think there's some winners of some sort. So um, I, if there's any more questions, I guess, before we do that, I'm happy to take them. Um, so it says we're about to announce 10 lucky winners who will get a copy of The Ambassador's Daughter and as an also as an added bonus, we'll get copies of my prior novel, The Things We Cherished. Um, so the winners are, I need a drum roll here. I'm going to read the names out as soon as I am given them. Okay, here we go. Chris Weiss, Connie Black Bloker, Bookaholic Mum, Mary Primarak, Emily Ann Lewis, Laura McDonald, G.S. Barbie, 4D563, Ruth Gonzalez, and Bruce Hamilton. Congratulations. Congratulations to you. Um, and I just want to say again, um, you know, it's a real pleasure that we could, uh, oh, and if your name's listed above, please email, uh, if you're a winner there, uh, booktrib, B-O-O-K-trib, book at booktrib.com with your mailing address to claim your prize. Booktrib at booktrib.com to claim your prize. And I just wanted to say again what a thrill it is to have this dialogue with you. And please um, find me on Facebook, find me on Twitter, let me know what you think of The Ambassador's Daughter so we can continue this conversation together. And thank you so much for being here.